Let's start in a couple of minutes. Let's start the talk in a couple of minutes. Shall we start, everyone? Welcome, there are more seats over there. You can sit here. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, wow. So happy. Everything is back to life. <laughs> Slush back to life in our Nordic startup communities here. Super vibrant, super happy. Um, today we are talking about Web3 and uh, specifically about Web3 infrastructure. And we have two awesome projects. Uh, one is Fluence project and another is um, a Protocol Labs, which is IPFS and Filecoin. So we will hear from uh, two speakers today. And um, let's thank uh, our host today, it's Wonderdog. Willi, maybe you want to say a few words? Ooh. Yes, definitely. So uh, great to, and honored to be the host for this very interesting and, and sort of a, a hot topic that we have here served for uh, today. And uh, like I said uh, in the beginning, uh, there is lots of drinks. I'm pretty sure that we cannot consume everything. Don't take it as a challenge, but you can find more from there and from the sort of back door as well. Uh, there are some uh, salty snacks, sweets available. And for those who had the pizzas in the first go, uh, lucky you, but there will be more coming in say around 50 minutes. So no worry there, you will get something to buy as well. And uh, yeah, uh, that's all from, uh, the official part, ah, of course, yeah, one thing I forgot uh, for those uh, attending this live meeting, for those uh, coming online, uh, we have also sauna available uh, here after the talks, then it should be warm already. So we have towels as well. So those interested in that one as well, uh, there's an option to do it. What else? Uh, karaoke was promised at some stage. Well, let's see what happens with that one. Uh, I. Yes, first we drink anything, then we'll uh, go there to sauna, hopefully don't fall asleep. And if we all survive that game, then there's the karaoke. Is the sauna, on? sauna is on, yeah. And one thing I'll promise not to sing in the karaoke. And I and to sing. Oh, excellent. But yeah, so uh, great to have so many uh, faces here and we were ac actually able to fit into this uh, sort of main area as well. Uh, I think I have talked already too much. It's time for the real experts to come and hop on the board and let's welcome our first speaker. Tom Trowbridge from Tom. Fluence. Thank you, thanks very much. Um, I'm gonna put my water here where it doesn't jeopardize uh, the whole rest of the, the, the operation. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, Let's see, we get that full screen. There we go, great. Just, just as a question, so I can kind of calibrate my comments a little bit. People here, how many um, Web 2? No Web 2, is everyone here Web 3? All right, I need some hands. Who here is involved in Web 3? Some. Who here is involved in Web 2? A bunch, okay. Every, and every, who here is involved in blockchain? Which is not necessarily the same thing, okay. All right, so we've got some, some levels of familiarity, all right. Well, I'm going to be talking about Web3 and, and kind of talking about it at a, at a high level. Some of this you will know. In fact, some of this, everybody will know a piece of this, but I hope no one has thought about it quite this way. So let's see. Um, so first, first, quick background on me, co-founder of Fluence, which is where we're here talking about. But I'm also on the board of Stronghold Digital Mining, which is an environmentally beneficial Bitcoin miner listed on the NASDAQ. And I helped um, found and put together Hedera Hashgraph HBAR, which is an enterprise-grade blockchain governed by enterprises. Um, so this is kind of the map of what I want to talk about quickly, which is um, why peer-to-peer -peer and then kind of how peer-to-peer -peer and why not blockchain? Um, because peer-to-peer -peer is not the same as blockchain. I want to talk about that because that gets conflated a lot. And then open source is the answer for those Web2 that that's, a, that's more targeted to you. The Web3 people, that's probably pretty, pretty self-explanatory. And then how does crypto fit in? And that's um, Maybe this audience understands that pretty well given the blockchain um, component. So first I wanna talk about big tech censorship. And so if you um, have paid attention to the news, you've seen more and more stories about um, the totalitarian governments um, really clamping down on dissent via the large technology platforms. And so we've arrived at an internet that has consolidated into um, you know, primarily one social platform, primarily one search engine, primarily, you know, a handful of, um, 
of hosting providers, and that has pr basically been a convenient place for totalitarian governments primarily to exert influence and censorship. And so a lot of examples of your kind of the neighboring country from where we are right now, censoring not only political opponent Navalny, but also you know Google taking applications off that allow people, that kind of ex ex um, help people vote. Um, also, this clearly happens in China quite, su quite, um, quite substantially. But what's interesting, it doesn't just happen in totalitarian governments. India is the largest democracy in the world, and India has had, you know, significant, um, made significant headlines by exerting extreme pressure on Twitter um, and also WhatsApp, threatening executives with jail um, if they didn't comply with taking down the accounts of opposition politicians or just accounts that were providing narratives counter to what the government wanted. Um, and this goes beyond even governments in their own countries. You know, China um, has long been very sensitive about the Tiananmen Square um, um, episode, and Microsoft, um, you know, claimed inadvertently to ban images related to that incident in countries other than China, like Germany and the UK and France. And they claimed that was human error. We're not sure, obviously, if that's the case or not, but just shows that the censorship extends um, quite beyond just these countries. Um, beyond censorship, though, there also is a uh, real stranglehold from an infrastructure perspective. And so 60% of the web is estimated to be hosted by Amazon, Google, um, and by uh, Microsoft Azure. So that's 60% that's of the cloud, and I guess that's not 60% of the web, but 60% of the cloud, which is a lot of the web, is, done, is hosted by those companies. And they're growing revenue at about 50% a year. To grow revenue at 50% a year, you've gotta be doing something very right or very wrong. And they are um, you know, clearly doing that because they're providing a service that people like, but they also have provided something that's very hard to leave. And so these proprietary platforms are very difficult to get out of once you're into them. Um, and the data isn't easily transportable. You have a difficult time moving from one to the other. And as an example of this, this data is a little bit old, but Lyft um, pays estimates about 14 cents per ride to AWS. That's about how high their hosting costs are, which is substantial. And so small companies, it's a big benefit because they can enter into these ecosystems without the upfront cost of actually developing all this code themselves in the backend infrastructure. But, and big companies like Samsung, which quite publicly has extricated themselves from AWS, have the resources to do that. If you're stuck in the middle, you have a real difficult time. And one example here, of the control they exert is a social media network that had 2.3 million users that AWS shut off for a terms of service violation. Um, this is Parler, and you know we may not like Parler's politics, um, and they're clearly not by sort of by no stretch are they providing the human the good for the world that say Chinese dissidents are. I would I would argue, but it's still remarkable that a business of that size can be shut down with no warning and no redress for a terms of service violation. Um, and that just shows the power that these companies have and that they exert. And so even if you don't think you have any risk of being shut down because you're not you know, allowing some kind of uh, negative content on your site, you c if you're an executive, you can't help but be aware of this power that these centralized um, uh, hosting providers can exert over your business. And just knowing that can change your, um, your actions. And if one thing, if this centralized infrastructure resulted in flawless execution, but centralized infrastructure leads to vulnerabilities, and that's what centralization, that's a problem with centralization, right? You have, you have benefits of scale, but also risks of scale. And I think all of us experience the WhatsApp and um, Facebook outage of a, I mean, at this point, it's a couple months ago. And that's, you know, for, for me and for others, I guess it's been an inconvenience. But there's plenty of businesses in the world, particularly in emerging markets, that rely on WhatsApp to perform their daily functions. And there are even government and agencies, again, in, in, you know, outside of some of the Western world that really rely on these platforms. And so when those actually go down, that has real world implications and real world issues. Um, that's not the first time these things have gone down. They go down both because of, and can go down for malicious intent, but also just because of human error and failures. And that's what happens when you have centralized 
systems, they are vulnerable to either they're tempting attack targets and they're vulnerable to mistakes. And we see this again and again and again with these platforms. Um, and is this the internet we signed up for? Uh, Tim Berners-Lee's internet and the, the sort of the real architect of the web, this was most assuredly not what he had in mind. His innovation was this hyperlink um, protocol um, that allowed the sharing of any type of information, any type of format of information via hyperlinks with the goal of democratizing access and, and allowing voices kind of all over the world to be heard. And that to a large extent has happened, but the problem is that scale, the internet uh, rewards scale, and as users, we like convenience. And so when you have users, that gets you more revenue, you then can more market more, make a slicker UI, get more users, and that flywheel is very hard to beat. And then on top of that, we'd rather not go to 10 different websites to buy things. We'd rather not go to 10 different search engines. And that's just human nature. So the problem is we have a web that has developed both because of economics and because of human nature kind of convenience to these dominant providers. And that's left us in a rather precarious position. On top of it, big companies historically always interact with governments. You can go back to the East India Company in Holland, right? They were integrated with the government more or less. You go back to IBM, it was with, you know, it was tight with government. Railroads were in the US, right? So telcos, clearly. So whenever companies get big, they have to interact with government and vice versa. And if they don't, they can be really targeted by governments and then shareholders revolt, throw out the management, new management will come in, that will then, you know, tow the government line. And so you end up with these, but the difference now is you have these businesses that have much more broad impact in our worlds than just transport or import or commerce. There's commerce, there's um, media, and there's all kinds of um, uh, interaction that they can dominate. And there's never been kind of riskier or more consequential businesses for governments to have control over. And so how did we get here? You know, we started off in the world of mainframes and desktops. Everybody's kind of familiar with this, Web 1.0. Um, and that was, that kind of started, started everything. And then kicking and screaming, people moved to the cloud platforms. And originally people thought, well, gee, I want to host my own data. It's cheaper, it's m more secure. And then everyone realized, actually, maybe the cloud is cheaper. Maybe it's not my core business. I should outsource this. So over 20 years, people moved to the cloud platform. And I remember I was actually invested in web um, data centers back in the mid -90, late 90s. And it was a struggle to get companies to move on to them. Fast forward, and these are the biggest, most profitable businesses in the world, pretty much. Well, what's, what's the future? Um, it's peer-to-peer -peer platforms. And peer-to-peer -peer platforms are the next generation of the web, and they are, I think, inevitable, and frankly, we, we, we need to have them, but why are they inevitable? Because they have better scalability, higher security, and better resilience. And so there's no centralized bottlenecks, single points of failure, and they're much more censorship resistant. So let's go into each one of these. So peer-to-peer -peer can scale faster, and why is that? It, because it's decentralized open architecture, so it's effectively a marketplace of hardware hosting. So when prices, when there's demand for lots of hosting, pricing goes up. What does that mean? People around the world can contribute hardware. What does that do? Drives prices down. So you could, there's no company that can react as fast as a global marketplace to meet demand needs. And so I think anyone in a peer-to-peer in -peer infrastructure world can contribute hardware to the network and the, price the and the price of those resources and the price of it will obviously respond to that, um, that, that addition of resources. And so you also have a precisely um, kind of infinite precision in terms of pricing where people that want incredibly high resilience, multiple locations, multiple geographies can pay for it. Someone that wants something very simple can just pay a small amount for that. Um, and it's also censorship resistant. Applications hosted in a peer-to-peer -peer network don't um, depend on one owner. Any author can host. They can run anywhere. Um, and one thing that's less talked about on the censorship resistance side is the infiltration of existing platforms by government security services. And uh, one data point we have on this is that um, either Saudi um, security forces or e infiltrated or else Twitter employees were just co-opted into selling the identities of activists in Saudi 
to the Saudi government, and those activists ended up um, imprisoned, as did some of the people that they communicated with. I can't imagine this is the first time this has happened, and it certainly won't be the last. And so in a peer-to-peer -peer environment where code is open source, the security is visible for everybody to see, you have far better protections. And I think that is something which will be pretty interesting to see. Also, obviously, in peer-to-peer -peer open application um, environment, there are no legal entity to compel, no management to threaten, no directors to pressure, and no shareholders to, um, to worry about. Um, and peer-to-peer -peer is no centralized, um, obviously, failure points. Applications can live on the network, can be hosted by any number of individual or institutional providers, and there's no particular reliance on a particular hardware or connectivity provider, and the code is open source and reliable. And what this means is we may end up with in a world of one browser as well, but let's hope it's something like Brave or something that's open source so you can see it, you understand how the algorithms work, and people can opine and edit and change and move them, and it's not happen, and it doesn't happen in an opaque environment. And same with same with the shopping algorithm or same with the social media algorithm for sure. Um, and so what type of traction do we have in peer-to-peer? -peer? Well, we have traction in payments, right? That's Bitcoin, it's Ethereum, it's all the crypto everyone here knows in blockchain. That is a big market, right? It's over two, what, two and a half, almost three trillion right now, and tens of billions of dollars a day. So I think it's safely say that peer-to-peer -peer payments is functioning. Um, and then storage. Our lovely, you know, terrific co-hosts here as well have demonstrated and, and blazed the path in terms of decentralized storage. That is clearly functioning, and the numbers are very large in terms of what's hosted, and that is on a trajectory straight upward. And so those two pieces are solved. But the piece that hasn't yet been solved is the compute piece, and that's the red piece at the bottom. And when you have a compute engine and you add that to storage and you add it to payments, you now have a disaggregated cloud competitor. And you can put those three things together and you really have viable alternatives to the cloud for the first time. And so that peer-to-peer -peer compute, and by the way, this is where I'm gonna go, doesn't have to be on-chain. And I think a lot of people, particularly in the blockchain Web3 web space, have assumed it has to be on-chain, but it doesn't, and I'm gonna talk about it in a second. Um, you know, but first, why now? And it's because I think we're at a time where the technology has evolved to actually allow this, and we can talk about what Fluence is built that actually shows this is functioning. But you also have the awareness at a pretty much all-time high of censorship and of self-sovereign identity importance and of personal data ownership. And I think people now have seen that and the Web3 movement has made this very clear that there is a really core group of people very concerned about these issues and ready to do the effort to adopt it. That wasn't the case five years ago, right? It was it the case a year ago or two years ago, yes but it's grown substantially, and I think we'll, con we'll continue, continue to. Um, and this is just a quick point that Web3 applications don't have to be blockchain-based, all right? We think of them as being peer-to-peer, -peer, and peer-to-peer -peer is not synonymous with blockchain. Um, and if you think about blockchain in general, consensus overhead is generally high, and obviously there are layer two solutions, and there's you know, solutions like Hedera that are far faster and cheaper, but it's still, you don't, most applications don't require that consensus, but you ideally have an application that if you need consensus and you want that trustlessness, you can plug it in and use it. But by default, you don't require it. Um, I'm gonna be quick on the open source bit here. Um, open source is the answer. I hope that isn't too much, uh, too much of a controversial statement here. If this was a traditional crypto conference, I don't think I'd even have to have these slides but given um, we are at Slush and there's a lot of proprietary technology here, I'll just mention for a second, um, just a fun, fun thing to talk about, which is Brooks Law, which is kind of a, a, a fun thing, which is that if you have a software um, project which is late and you add engineers to it, you make it later. And, and that's, that's really um, a function of the, the communication overhead, which when you have a team, every person you add to that team, the communication increases by the square of that addition, sort of a reverse of, um, of, of kind of Metcalf's law. But um, anyway, so that's why we've seen centralized, the complexity of centralized systems um, being built. And so, you know, this is, I've taken this from Eric Raymond's The, the Cathedral and the Bazaar, and the Bazaar being the way in which the um, terrific code being built in all these platforms that everyone knows and uses, I hope. Um, but open source, you know, despite um, being terrific, has an issue in terms of monetization. And so we, in some sense, are in the golden age of open source monetization, 
with 15 publicly traded uh, over that, uh, over worth over a billion dollars. Um, but there's two models. One is you're open source, but you have hosting, and people pay you to host the open source. What that means as a, as a CEO, you have to build all of this hosting infrastructure, and that's complicated. It has nothing to do with the software code you're writing. The other open source monetization is this consulting kind of enterprise integration model where you hire a whole team of salespeople and a whole people team of developers and you run around talking to your clients and telling them how to tweak this issue, make it specific to them for this, and you can do that, but also now you're hiring teams and paying them and it's incredibly complex and has nothing to do with your core business of building software. And so um, even with those terrific successes in the open source world, 90 plus percent of projects still struggle for funding and are reliant on grants and donations. And so, you know, and even companies that are open source and do monetize, the cloud still takes their code, puts it on their system, and charges for it. And so MariaDB, um, you know, I've heard an estimate that MariaDB thinks that Amazon gets about a billion dollars of revenue from MariaDB. That's just one, you know, open source database uh, company. And so that's what these, um, that's what these um, web, web um, these, these um, clouds do. So innovation suffers because all these businesses require cloud services and there's no way to, to really get them easily outside of this. So what a better model is, is, um, is the Fluence model. And so what Fluence does is it has this peer-to-peer -peer network right, of, ho of nodes that host code completely open network where anyone can join the network and uh, or leave the network. And then it has, and takes, that takes place of the, the marketplace um, dynamics I was referencing earlier. And then we have a programming language called Aqua, which is the first language for peer-to-peer -peer workflows and applications that allows native composition of peer-to-peer -peer applications. And that allows easy composition of um, applications, which is, you know, makes life obviously much simpler for developers. Um, but the last piece, which ties into open source, which is critical, is that when code is uploaded to Fluence, um, there is a potential for the authors to share in hosting revenue. And so this is our attempt to drive an ecosystem and to actually reward developers. So let me explain how this works. So if you write a module or, or some open source code, you upload it onto Fluence, and you have with that a um, a payment that you will request or, or is conditional for a host that hosts your code to pay you. Importantly, if they host it, this isn't a donation, it's not a grant, and it is paid based on use. If no one uses your code, you don't get anything. If people use it, the host via smart contract, automatically some portion of its hosting revenue goes to you. We don't think this will cause open source developers to buy boats and, and, and airplanes, but there'll be small, um, but there will be revenue that will be generated from this, which will support open source developers. And so there is plenty of margin in hosting for some small piece of it to go on a seamless fashion to the original host. Now, could people copy this code and host it for free because it's open source? Yes, but we think that's not unlike kind of check marks in Twitter. They'll be verified. The host will um, get value from having verified, authenticated modules that come from the original author. And so the end users will only see the hosting fee. They'll just compare hosting fees like they do on current platforms right now. And when they pay that, some piece will go to the original um, um, software author, some of which can be monetized. And so we think this leads to an incredibly interesting ecosystem where more developers host put code on Fluence. That then leads to more unique and um, interesting applications that are possibly built on Fluence, which leads to more people using Fluence, which leads to more code being posted on Fluence, and ultimately you get a innovation cycle that no centralized company can beat. AWS could pull whatever they want, right, and host and charge for anything they want because it's open source, but they won't be able to operate at the speed and depth of the global developer community. And so that's what we're, we're very excited about. And how does crypto fit in? Well, three ways. Payment allows, and this, again, I'm guessing in this audience, I don't have to, you know, tell how great crypto is. It's some other audiences that is a little bit different. But immediate trackable transactions, no minimums. But really thinking about this, if you're hosting in, pick your country, um, 
uh, I don't know, maybe you're, you're, writing, you're writing code in Senegal and you're, the host is in um, the US and the user is in Europe, you know, what currency you're going to use? And you can maybe denominate in dollars. As an American, I can't help but mention that, and that seems fine to me. But paying for that, well, you can use a credit card, bank statement. Depending on the payments, that's difficult. Do you have chargebacks? Are you taking credit risk? With crypto, you can do this simul You can do this immediately with no counterparty risk in almost limitless denominations. And I think that's, that is why crypto is the future for payments, as I think most people here would understand. It also helps for governance. And, you know, Fluence and others are governed by a DAO. That means if you own a coin, you have a vote. And that's democratic and inclusive. Um, and allows people to help govern this protocol, have an ownership in it, and actually participate in its success as well. And that is also unusual and different from most other um, you know, traditional, traditional models. And even if um, some of that governance is, a bit, is, is corrupted, because open source, people can govern it even outside of it. So that if there's multiple levels of protections built into it when you have this type of model. And then finally, Crypto helps from funding perspective because the DAO has a treasury. And the more people think a project is successful, the higher value the treasury would be. That provides more value to give developer grants, to encourage the ecosystem, encourage building. The more building, the more likely the successful, the more likely the success of the project and protocol is. The higher their value there is in the DAO, the more there is to fund, and you get another virtuous cycle going on as well. So that's also very hard to beat. So um, that is that wheel, which you've seen before. So you know, where, where do we think this leaves us? Well, peer-to-peer -peer is the future. Um, and we think that compensation for open source really works when it's based on use and when it's a, you know, a kind of a transparent um, uh, funding mechanism that people really don't even need to see or to pay for explicitly. And the protocol that can enable this type of infrastructure, maybe it's Fluence, maybe it's not, maybe someone else figures out a better model, but someone that figures this out will create a global network and a global um, developer ecosystem that no centralized company can compete with. And when you do this, by the way, things that will be built that we can't imagine because the amount of modules, the amount of people working to build interoperable uh, code and projects will allow a level of innovation that we, I think, have difficulty imagining. And so I'll close with just a question about what kind of world do we want? Do we want three companies really controlling internet hosting? And do we want content monitored and controlled by nation states with huge barriers to building anything independently? I don't think so. That's definitely not the model I don't think any of us want. And so peer-to-peer -peer open source and crypto economics is pretty much the only chance we have and the only architecture that can compete with these centralized dominant companies right now. That's it. There's no other way I can think of to compete with these massive companies. And so if you, you think that, then support Web3, host, contribute, um, and follow, and help us and help everyone um, empower the next wave of internet innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, does anyone have questions? Hello, uh, my name is Kashif, and uh, <clears throat> I really enjoyed your talk. Very, very impressive. First of all, thank you for such an impressive talk. And secondly, some countries like China and India, for example, have been trying to push back against this peer-to-peer uh, -peer kind of things, including but not limited to uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain technologies. So how do you see the future in those kind of scenarios? You know, I think companies companies will certainly push back on it. I think, you know, China is the largest example of that. And I think what what is if you go back to China though over uh, its history, you know, China was very slow to adopt gold standard. It stayed on the silver standard for an incremental, you know, 30, 50 years. And that actually slowed its development down dramatically. It lost almost a generation of development as a result. So they don't have a history of having, making the best choices in some of these areas. The world can develop and this whole infrastructure can develop without them. So I'm not super worried about that. I am, 
uh, India being a democracy and I, uh, is, is a bit of a different story. I know there are continually bills put forward to try to um, in eliminate or prohibit cryptocurrency transactions in India. I'm optimistic those won't pass because India is obviously a very big market for all of this and the people vote. And so I think just taking a step back, that's why I'm also confident the US, every day that goes by where there is no draconian legislation in the US is a day of further adoption, further use and higher value where voters actually own it, which make it very difficult for government in the US to unroll it back. Every day that goes by where India doesn't do it makes it harder to do it. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but it means it's, po but it means it's harder. The further bit is that whenever there are rules put in, that actually will unleash a huge amount of additional capital for people that are on the sidelines currently and institutions on the sidelines currently mm -hmm. that are waiting for clarity. And so even if there are rules put in, which we view as stifling, um, potentially, you know, I'm speaking massive hypotheticals here, that could still encourage a lot more adoption because there, at least there are roles and guidelines for people who perform, companies in particular, to enter into the space. So somewhat of an answer. Thank you. So nice of you. More questions? OK. All right. It's still quiet. <laughs> OK, thank you so much, Tom, again. And uh, let's welcome the next speaker, um, Vukashin, from Protocol Labs. And there is also IPFS and um, Biocon yeah. project. He will we tell about it now. We do a bunch of things. I'm just going to pick up somewhere. Hey, uh, my name is Vuk. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, like a layer of abstraction uh, under uh, what uh, we discussed so far. So I'm gonna talk about like in general like how all of this happens uh, on a physical machine. And that machine usually is either on the data center or those machines are like the clients that we're using which are like mobile phones and so on. Uh, so a bit about myself. So I spent most of my past four years building tooling in the web free world. Uh, I was the founder of Tenderly, which is one of the most used uh, smart contract tools out there. Uh, then I joined Cardano, I led smart contracts and tokens for a year, uh, fun experience. Uh, and then I, I joined uh, Protocol Labs just because I thought that uh, like storage was not really at the point where we needed as humanity to have it and uh, just trying to like contribute a bit there uh, from like DeFi world uh, that was pretty well off. Uh, some random stuff that I also did is build like uh, offline social networks and uh, spent a bunch of time on Kubernetes and Docker. Uh, so where we are today with the data center. So basically we have like a couple of, yeah, as, uh, as this was highlighted before, we have like a couple of like major cloud providers that are basically owning most of the data centers today. Like and the reason for that is that either they are using those resources uh, internally by like training big uh, uh, machine learning models or, yeah, should I? Intel CPU. So yeah, like most of the data centers today are basically managed by big tech and uh, either they are using those resources internally to like train very big models uh, with our data, like without telling us, uh, like Google Photos, uh, and uh, or they are like renting that through like the cloud providers that they have and basically it's that, like you just have like the big tech companies that are renting the infrastructure that they have like ill and not u using it, yeah, like. I can do even be without, like, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no worries. But yeah, uh, the reason for that is that, uh, like, the normal traditional data centers, which are, like, 
uh, naturally real estate businesses. They are not tech businesses. So basically those are like owning a, a bunch of infrastructure. They are thinking about fiber. They are thinking about like the data center physically where the things are gonna be stored. O also racks, electricity, like signing deals uh, for good uh, electricity and so on. Uh, and they couldn't of course compete with Google, uh, Amazon and the other ones that have basically taken that infrastructure and abstracted that away with a bunch of development tools that made initially the lives of developers a bit easier and then they made like uh, building things much faster. Now probably the life of developers, it's harder, but uh, it's easier for them to scale some particular things and they manage to like convince the rest of the world that this is the way to do it. Because of that, they are capturing a lot of value, but uh, they are charging for that like uh, incredible amounts like that are not like linked at all like, with the infrastructure that they are providing us like even based on like uh, uh, Moore's law like the ch prices are not going down like <laughs> and we are sure that the Moore's law is uh, is actually working so uh, yeah that unfortunately happened but even the worst uh, is that uh, yeah basically all of the uh, humanities data is like probably managed by less than 10 companies and th that happened because like uh, as a developer, you're not even aware of what you're doing. You're by default using some cloud provider and that cloud provider is like, storing that on some infrastructure that a particular legal entity is owning. And uh, then you have either Google, AWS or, or the other folks at the top of the environment that are actually like controlling and uh, owning that. Uh, even worse than that is that basically development tools that are built by developers that are not like AWS uh, and uh, Google and cloud provider developers are building development tools on top of those development tools. And like now it's so hard to like change that because like you have like layers of abstractions that are like just there. And we think that uh, those are useful for us, but like we have like no clue what was going on at the end of the day. Uh, and at the end, like the root uh, layer that uh, everything is running on is those virtual machines that are running like on those cloud providers. And uh, yeah. Uh, Th this is basically uh, putting us in a spot where I, as a developer, if I start to develop in anything, anything by default, that's gonna be on the cloud, by default. Like, I can't like develop like a, a, an app without saying, yeah, sure, I'm gonna use Firebase, or I'm gonna use some other like uh, database solution that I'm not managing myself. If I do that, I, I'm probably gonna get fired because like, uh, uh <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, like uh, th that that's the way that people are thinking about it today. And to, to a degree that's true because like at the beginning you're trying to reduce your risk uh, of like uh, building something uh, in time with little resources. So like the cloud is actually like helping a lot in, in that period, but layer is becoming like less valuable completely. But then like also the challenge of changing from the cloud infrastructure to something that is uh, not cloud is, uh, is difficult, especially web free because like in web free, you're not gonna basically just move that, migrate that from like web two to web three, like the economy is gonna be completely different. If you're building something on web three, you're building a web three app. You're not like converting a web two app. Similarly, that happened uh, in the beginning of the internet. We had like people that were like scanning like yellow pages and thought that <laughs> that was a good idea. Yeah, it turned out not to be that useful. We had like better tools for that. S the same is gonna happen for web three. We are not gonna be converting those apps that easily. Uh, it's gonna be completely different because you, you will wanna have like those users participate in those networks, maybe like on the data they have, maybe have ways of uh, uh, capturing some of the revenue that is generated by the network with that data. And uh, yeah, bringing back like that ownership uh, to the users. So yeah, uh, as I mentioned, some, some of the very like uh, big issues with uh, centralized infrastructure is that uh, at the end you're gonna have like a legal entity that is basically owning uh, your data uh, and any tool that is actually using uh, that cloud provider is also gonna be like giving that ownership uh, to someone else. Of course you have like some terms of use that are massaging that a bit but at the end like someone is controlling the data that you're getting from your users and you're not even aware that this is a bad thing as a developer unfortunately. Uh, well, we in the centralized infrastructure, what we're trying to do is we are trying to have like an equal playing field where we have like many participants, including like data center operators, developers, users that can actually like benefit from the network uniformly. Uh, and also because uh, we are able to like uh, bake in like the rules of the protocol uh, 
so that like everyone that is participating in that network has like aligned values. We are not trying like to, to build like something, uh, something that is better than something else. We are trying to build the ecosystem where we have like uh, many participants and everyone is trying to like think about uh, how to participate in that and generate value. Because for example, if I'm a storage provider, miner, however you want to call it, my objective is to onboard as much storage as possible. Uh, I get more rewards if I store like useful data, so I'm incentivized to do that. And that is perfectly aligned with what's the value for, for uh, the entire ecosystem, because if I have like useful data on the network that can be used, then I'm gonna have other applications that are like consuming that data and uh, a lot of value is gonna be generated in the process. Uh, also very important is that like the development tools are like for everyone. Those are for the ecosystem. Uh, those are not built for every cloud provider like uh, uh, uniquely, like what's happening right now. Uh, instead of like building something just for my employer, which might be AWS or Google, I'm building that for everyone. And then everyone can build on top of that and uh, that has like compounding effects that are very hard to imagine right now. Uh, but before we get there, like what we need to do is like, uh, we need to cover a couple of things. Of course, I'm just gonna try to cover one today because uh, like they are very like uh, uh, large as well, like the other ones. Uh, the one that I wanna focus on is like, how do we actually like orchestrate this in the data center and what does it actually mean and how it really looks in the data center. So the objective is to like, of course, reduce the barrier to entry to participate in that network. So for example, if you are uh, like a data center that has like a bunch of uh, machines, but you're not sure like what to do with them. The only model that you had so far is rent those for like a monthly fee or or rent the entire data center to, to Google or <laughs> whoever else. Uh, now you're able to like basically start like running uh, an operation that is like contributing to the Web3 uh, uh, like ecosystem and in that way uh, what we are trying to do is uh, just lower the barrier, just make it as easy as possible so that uh, maybe like a data center in Germany that is very good at optimization, but very bad at software can actually like uh, just onboard the entire data center. This is very hard today, like uh, because we, we are just at the beginning where like even like onboarding storage is not that trivial since the launch of the network, which happened like a year ago, uh, this improved act it X, but like it's still very hard and you need to do some orchestration so. Uh, another very interesting thing is that since those uh, like data centers need to have like skin in the game in the sense that if you're storing like data uh, that was uh, uh, like stored by a particular storage client, uh, you can't like disappear. Like, and that is like a possibility. Like if you're doing like a peer-to-peer -peer network that uh, is focused on storage, like who guarantees that like I'm not gonna go offline? Like fine, I got some revenue uh, from the reward so far, but like tomorrow like the entire data center goes like bankrupt and uh, I go offline. Uh, that shouldn't happen. So because of that, we have like very high collateral requirements that those data centers need to put in uh, when they are uh, like on boring storage to the network. So they need to have like a lot of tokens that are, uh, that are there as collateral in the case of uh, that particular storage uh, uh, operator going offline. Because of that, they are not gonna likely go offline because someone else could actually like buy their infrastructure and uh, make sure that they obey the storage deals that they have signed and uh, then only go offline and offboard that storage from the network. Uh, but because of that, it's very hard for those uh, uh, data centers to actually finance all of that because like, uh, like that collateral is higher than uh, the CapEx that they have invested in that infrastructure. So what we are trying to do is massage that a bit where we are not risking too much, uh, but we are uh, allowing people to like uh, leverage a bit uh, their cells and like grow uh, faster uh, than the network. Uh, but we are doing that in a smart way where we are basically like tracking like what's happening on those actual machines, like collecting a lot of logs and trying to figure out like where does a storage provider that actually is a reputable one that will not go offline. If that's the case, then we can like uh, just uh, uh, offload that risk to someone else, uh, like uh, maybe a DeFi user that wants to do like revenue share, or uh, we can like uh, just uh, onboard the uh, institutional investor into it. Uh, 
Yeah, so where we are today, like uh, we have 13 exabytes of data that was onboarding in the past year. Uh, this, this is enormous, like compared to the cloud, the cloud uh, was at one exabyte after a year and a half, one exabyte, and we are at 13 right now. So like it's around 13 times faster growth compared to what was happening with the cloud. And this is not because like, uh, uh, we did anything smart. <laughs> it's just because of the sheer power of like having decentralized networks. And this happened like multiple times in the crypto uh, cycles. Like first with Bitcoin, you had like a bunch of people that want to have like crypto mining infrastructure. They figured out that this is a profitable business. Of course, it was profitable for a very short time. Uh, and then like everyone starts buying those machines. The same happened for Ethereum. And then you had like a bunch of other like proof of work networks that had like uh, that had uh, basically the same effect where they started growing so fast exponentially. Uh, the only difference is that here we are not growing like just because people are putting in like stupid GPUs like uh, in computers that can't do anything than hashing. Here we are talking about like having storage that can actually be used. Uh, because the way that consensus was done for Filecoin was in a where, way where you have storage power that of course like um, helps uh, do consensus but storage power is useful because that means that that sealed storage that you have can actually be used for something else. And because of that, that requires some computing to happen before the storage is, uh, is online. Uh, but yeah, like uh, just to make things a bit more simple, I don't know whether like we are technical here or should I skip those slides? Are we technical? Yeah. 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 Okay. So. Basically, we are going to have like um, most of the time a data center. Those machines are going to have like very different resources. So like some machines are going to have like uh, many CPUs, uh, uh, many cores. Some are going to have like uh, a lot of memory, but not so many cores. And some are going to have just GPUs. Uh, and maybe we are going to also have like a few machines that have like a lot of uh, hard drives that are rated and uh, have like uh, massive uh, amounts of storage that are attached to fa fast internet connects. When you think about Filecoin, you would think that uh, the Filecoin network runs something like this on those machines, but uh, this is uh, not completely true. Uh, and uh, mainly because of the things that I just mentioned around like the fact that you need to do some processes before you can actually like onboard that storage to the network because like it's not just providing some space on your hard drive and hoping that that particular uh, data center is not gonna go offline. It's more about like making sure that this never goes offline and uh, that we have proofs that this is actually being stored all the time. So what's happening uh, is something like this where we are basically uh, on one side uh, s doing the sealing of the data which is on boring of the data to the network but then we are also proving to the network every 24 hours for every sector that we are storing uh, on our infrastructure that the sector is actually there. Th that alone like unlocks so many possibilities because you're finally able to prove uh, in a formal way that a particular uh, file was uh, stored in a particular time. You can't do that right now with cloud providers because it's mainly like in the Google Drive and like Google says that that file was there at that time. No, now you have like a formal proof that is stored on chain forever that that particular file was there. Uh, this of course also allows us to make sure that whenever someone uh, goes offline or a particular file is not actually there or corrupted, that we do a lot of slashing just to make sure that that miner does never think about like not storing that. Because of uh, those requirements, what naturally happened is that most miners have like redundant power supplies, a lot of redundancy on the hard drives. Uh, they have redundant uh, connections, like they, they have free connections at, at sometimes, like uh, two fiber, one 4G in the case of like the second fiber going off. Uh, but uh, on the other uh, side, you have also like um, uh, the ceiling, which is very complex. Uh, but maybe I'm not gonna get in there. Wh uh, what's only important to know is that even the ceiling process has like different uh, resource requirements in different stages, meaning that those cannot be done on the same uh, machine. So here you're gonna have like a lot of communication between those machines where uh, basically it's going through like a high memory machine to a machine that has many cores 
possibly to a GPU machine, and then finally to the storage uh, machine that is actually like storing that particular sector in a final form. What I want to talk about is like how do we now make this storage useful? Because so far we are just storing files, and archival is of course an important thing. But like if you're not doing any computing uh, most of the time, like you're gonna archive once, and you're not gonna do anything else again for a very <laughs> long time. <laughs> this is why it's called archival. Uh, so like in order to like connect computing, we need to do a couple of things. So on one side, we need to be aware about like what is the computation that is happening uh, on those networks, how that is described by the developer and so on. But then we also need to abstract away the complexity associated with Filecoin because it is hard. Like you need to create storage deals. You need to like negotiate storage deals with the miners. Those miners need to accept those. You need to have some awareness of that. Uh, then you need to have like a sense of reputation. Like if I'm storing particular uh, data on a particular miner uh, and that disappears, like what uh, happens then? Like uh, I need to have like at least a sense where those miners are located, like how much uh, storage do they already have? Like do they have like uh, any other liability if they go offline other than uh, the collateral that they would lose. So also on top of that, I need to be aware about all the certificates that those miners have, like in terms of infrastructure, like ICO, or stuff like that. So what we need is a, a layer that actually like help us create those deals and uh, have some awareness of that. And that's something that we built recently, and this is something that is currently growing expo exponentially, which we think is uh, getting us to a point where finally we are gonna be getting more and more traction because a very hard problem was solved that was like b basically like churning most of the developers that were trying to do anything on the platform. Uh, that is called estuary, uh, and uh, that is basically there to make sure that the storage deals are made with miners uh, with high reputation. We have lists of miners. Uh, we are in touch with those miners. Also, like all those deals are verified, meaning that those miners get like more rewards because like all of the data that is actually like, stored through those uh, estuary nodes uh, is useful data because that came from a, a either like a third command or it came from some REST API or like the UI that we have that is actually talking to that API. And you can see here how fast it is growing. Uh, currently, we have 11 million deals, uh, sorry, files that were stored like to Raspberry and around seven, uh, 70,000 uh, storage deals. Uh, and this happened like in three months. Now, the most interesting part is that what's gonna end up happening is that we have like those nodes that are like running on the same local network and we finally don't need to rely on the internet and like source things like to S3 or uh, think about how that is gonna be managed by the cloud providers. Instead, we have like the storage layer which is sitting next to the machines that are doing computing. And uh, that is super fast because most of the time in data centers, you're gonna have like 100 uh, uh, gig uh, connections while the speed of your internet connection is mostly gonna be like from one uh, gig to like 10 gigs, but not much more than that. Uh, on top of that, there is a lot of capital that is being poured in uh, like uh, networking, mainly because of the innovation that is happening in AI, where you, you need a lot of like uh, bandwidth between the nodes that are actually computing those models. So that is gonna be even faster and even cheaper. And at the end, what's gonna happen is that simply uh, the result is gonna be retrieved uh, by the final user just through IPFS, and IPFS is uh, available either through like gateways that are like very easy to access, or you can directly like call uh, some node that you're either running or uh, you know some node that you wanna call. But yeah, one important piece is missing, uh, and this is something that I'm uh, particularly interested uh, about and uh, something that I'm incubating at Protocol Labs, uh, which is like orchestration of like those networks. So like, how do we like make sure that all of the computing networks and all of uh, the networks that are very spe specialized at particular jobs, for example, rendering, you have like networks that just do rendering, nothing else. How do we make sure that like that orchestration can be done like efficiently on the data center, but abstracting away completely the uh, 
the complexity uh, involved into like understanding all those workloads as a data center operator. And at the end, like what they care at as someone that is running like a data center uh, that is just a capex for me, I just care about the revenue and I care about like potential future revenue and maybe I care about the reputation that I have because that will of course uh, implicate that I'm gonna be getting more storage deals and of course more revenue. But that's all I care. On the other hand, uh, what we care as an ecosystem is to like finally bring back like uh, the ownership of the data to the actual owner, which is like the person that is generating that data. And uh, also very important, but very uh, frequently uh, like ignored is the fact that data is growing so fast that uh, we might be able to scale hard drives, but we are not able to scale like fiber optics and all the infrastructure that is very hard to scale. Like <laughs> you need to actually like put physical cables that are like very expensive, very long, involve ma many people and so on. Uh, we can offload some of that to satellites, but even that is very, uh, very uh, constrained. So what we need to do is be a bit smarter on how we are actually using that infrastructure, meaning that if I have a particular file on the local network, since I know that that file is there because I'm referencing that through the content, uh, uh, also known as CID uh, in the IPFS ecosystem, then I don't need to uh, like retrieve something from the cloud and use the internet. It's already there. And uh, as those data centers are growing, like more frequently data is gonna be there and computing is gonna be happening uh, next to the data rather than retrieving the data every time and then doing the computing. And something that is very hard to imagine, but uh, uh, something that will probably get us to a point where we actually make this a reality and something that billions of users have an interaction with is new economic models that are gonna allow us to like break those lock-ins that uh, cloud providers are currently uh, like uh, gain revenue out and uh, create like new business models, which is not that hard to understand because like naturally we are the ones that are generating data and we are the ones that should be like extracting value out of it but somehow like because of like a strange uh, set of circumstances, we are like in a completely different realm where we are not like paying anything, but we are like paying with our attention, which is like even scarcer than the data that we're generating. Uh, but yeah, uh, I believe that in three years, like most of us are uh, gonna be paid to actually use apps and by getting to that point and we have like an economy that can support that, Filecoin and the, the work that uh, Fluency is doing as well, we are gonna be able to like earn by actually using things. That's already happening in gaming with uh, Axie Infinity, but it's not so hard to, to imagine also in a generalized uh, realm for everything. Yeah, that was it. If anyone has any questions, uh, this is my email. So yeah, either ask there or ask now. Maybe questions now? One question, somebody brave. Okay, cool. It means it was either very bad or very good. Mm. So I wanna ask about, uh, what do you think about the data marketplaces? And so of course, a lot of the data that people store on like IPFS and these kind of networks, it can be private, it can be encrypted, but what, are, what do you think about this kind of you know, public data that can be bought and what do you think is gonna be the future of that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's already kind of happening. Like, what, what you're not seeing that much usage, like you're mainly, uh, I mean, also it depends how, how we like think about that. Like, uh, I mean, who is the owner of a particular data set that is open? Like mm -hmm. the one that said that is the owner on the network. Mm -hmm. And uh, also it's important to have like other pieces that like make sure that that data is not gonna be easily replicated. So you need to have like pro probably some homomorphic encryp encryption involved to actually get to a point where that is a very powerful and uh, that cannot be like uh, somehow like maliciously used. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, like also when we think about the Falcon network uh, in general, like we are thinking more in terms of like the C of data that we are providing to developers rather than like infrastructure. If we can provide like all the data there and we have like very efficient ways of like moving the data around the network, mm -hmm. 
the developer doesn't actually care about the infrastructure. They just care about that data set. But we are not yet at the point where like that is easily like uh, being monetized other than us incentivizing that with like artificial weight by getting bounties and so on. But maybe. Yeah, hi. So uh, very interesting to kind of think the powers there behind like <coughs> in movements that, that, that are there like recognized like that for the Web3 and against Web3 and kind of situation how it's involving uh, and, and like the the movements and the forces against like this action that that how 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 would you describe it like in that way political way that 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 to to succeed with the, with the project that yeah i mean like uh, not sure whether i got the question entirely but like uh, in my opinion like the trigger for us to get to a point where we can start growing exponentially is like uh, politics like germany says like you're not storing anything outside of Germany. Like, do that with the cloud provider. It's so hard. Because, like, the cloud providers are moving data all the time because they are treating that like their data. Like, I remember at some point, like, Facebook was, like, ordered not to, like, send data outside of the EU. Yeah. And they said, like, we're just going to turn it off. Yeah. And they have so much leverage. Like, if they do that, you have wars. <laughs> like, I mean, people without yeah. Facebook? Yeah. Um, I <laughs> <laughs> May, may, maybe a bit differently, like that, that uh, like the bigger pro European projects, like when you brought up that with Germany, that like the Gaia X and and so on, that that and Europe for like this decentralized developments, that that I'm, I'm kind of asking, like this kind of yep. political I mean, I feeling there, that, that I think you are maybe better to you have the feeling from the success possibilities and what what are the like the difficult points there and and what it takes that where, where, where you see that, that how the development could go and what are the powers against like this and what what's for so could could we have kind of a that kind of a some feeling that that, that i'm not sure i understand the question <coughs> Sorry. Could, 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 could yeah, well yeah well it's a more common uh, question like that how the success from the Web3 development depends what are the forces for it or against it. That's the question. Hmm. That, 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 hmm. what, so in other words, what are the drivers of Web3 success and what are the, the, the impediments to that? Is that more or less a question? More or less. You okay. Can put it like that. I mean, you, you, I'm sure you've got a view as well. I mean, I guess gov regulation is certainly one, but I'd say we're heavily there with, I think it's, p it's a recognition of the importance of data ownership and consumer and companies' interest and prioritization of that. That to me is the case, because you, you could exist for the next 100 years in a Web 2 world if no one cared, right? You could do that, so it's really, a question of people caring enough to actually adopt something different and people believe that people care enough they put the resources in to build something that people can adopt right so it's those two things where we collectively need to recognize the dangers and challenges of web 2 and that make us ready to adopt and ready to invest in technologies that um, take us to Web3. So that, that's at least my answer. You may have another. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's going to be a couple of uh, like forces, as you said. So one, of course, is like Europe is trying very hard. Like, I mean, even to have like just clouds that are running in Europe, that, that's also hard. Like, because you need to build that software. Like, and, uh, and they are keeping that close. And uh, it's clear that uh, the business model uh, is that like build some IP and try to monetize as much as possible, even by stealing some value that was generated by open source projects. This is Redis, this is MariaDB, like that's happening all the time. Uh, so Europe started doing that. I think we are just gonna skip clouds because like, 
there is not enough incentive for anyone to work on that like for the next five years and actually like build what AWS and Google have today. By the way, AWS and, uh, and Google, they have like great tech. It is evil, but it's great tech. Like uh, <laughs> it works. Like uh, it allows like a developer to scale to a hundred million people with a few peers, like in a garage. It works. Th that's amazing. But does that align with the values that we have? Probably not. Uh, do we want to change those values? Uh, yeah, and this, these are the forces that are like uh, changing now. Like we are getting to a point where you're figuring out that this is not what we want. Like imagine having Instagram where you can actually change the algorithm. This is like the first use case that is going to be built on Web3. You can't imagine that on Instagram. And we're so like lost in what's happening right now without even imagining what can actually happen. You could imagine having apps that are consuming the same data that are like optimizing uh, our health or our happiness or just making sure that we don't see like things that we don't want to see, but like based on the criteria that we set them. And the top the, on top of that, like because of the economy that we're able to build with crypto networks, which we saw like in DeFi, which we saw like uh, in uh, many other networks, we are able to pay users for generating data. Of course, that is very hard to do because you need to make sure that someone is not maliciously generating data. So you need to have reputation. You need to have structures on how you're storing that uh, on those networks. And then you need to have like proper rules and like some proper governance that is actually like, managing that. It's hard, but it's possible. And when you get to a point where you're paying users to like use some apps, it's gonna explode. On top of all the others. Just, um, you, we talk about the transition. Can you talk about the, the drivers of Filecoin growth? And is it, is it usage and data demands that makes the capacity grow or do people add capacity on and then the pricing is such that it drives usage or does it work both ways? I'm just yeah. kinda, I don't have a sense of how it works. So the way we designed it is just to make sure that we can cover like first one part of the market, which was like, of course, the supply and we did a much better job than we should have, like we don't need 13 exabytes. <laughs> uh, but uh, the way it works is that like uh, you have like the block reward that is of course re uh, uh, re like Bitcoin, it's a uh, decrease over time that is being shared with all the uh, participants in the network. So you, you have like miners that are contributing like some committed capacity, for example, uh, 100 uh, uh, like terabytes. And if the block reward is uh, 25 fill, uh, and you have like 10 of those, they are just splitting that in 10 if they have like equal pieces. The interesting part is which gives us the chance to like work on those advanced economics models is that we are now able to uh, reward more for particular storage deals. Those are like storage deals that are not just uh, storage capacity that is committed, but useful data. When you are able to do that, you could also imagine having data that is generated by users that is being rewarded more by the protocol at some point. If that happens, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have the data center operators actually fighting for that data because they are able to get like more rewards for storing the same amount of data. Maybe it is gonna be more usage, but that usage is not as big as uh, the reward that they are getting more. In the case of just verified deals, which means this is not random data, this is data which is any data, but it's data, like uh, you can see it or you can consume it in a way, you're getting 10x the rewards. So if you're storing 100 terabits, you're actually storing 1,000 uh, uh, 1, terabits. And uh, miners wanna do that. And if we make it such that for structured data is even more uh, aggressive in terms of incentive, and we figure out ways how to like properly govern that you could imagine like miners actually paying developers to actually build apps that are like uh, generating user structured data and then developers can decide where they wanna trickle down some of that value to the users. And probably some are gonna do that because uh, that gives them traction and that's why they are building their product for. And then it kinda organically grows. By the way, we are not there yet. Yes. Sorry, hi, my name is Daniel. Um, just want to ask, you've got quite a few uh, 
people on your platform already. You, you have 70,000, uh, what was it, contracts or? Those are uh, storage deals. Those are oh, automatic. Yeah, storage yeah. deals. Uh, what drives people to use Filecoin? Why do they choose it? Yeah, I mean, like, there are two important uh, things to di differentiate. So one is Filecoin, one is IPFS. So like you have a lot of usage on IPFS and this is great. And IPFS is the thing that you use if you wanna build apps that are used by the final users. But then you re rely on Filecoin for all the incentives. Mm -hmm. And you're basically like just archiving that they are always there. So like it's mostly because people don't wanna like rely on uh, cloud providers. They would not wanna rely like uh, on CDNs. Uh, they don't wanna rely on something that uh, is completely centralized. Now. We are now getting to a point where they are doing some more advanced things, like uh, you have some interoperability, you have a way to like encrypt data like uh, in the open, but then share some keys with the, uh, the colleagues of, of yours. So it's not anymore like uh, on the cloud provider encrypted by default by the cloud provider. It's now encrypted by the keys that you're like managing and storing. Uh, also, uh, yeah, I mean like, the thing is that we are also like launching smart contracts in probably half a year, which will open up like even more like uh, the uh, moment where you are basically owning a particular data set. And then you can imagine data DAOs where like uh, you have individual uh, users that are like owning a particular data set that can be in an encrypted form and that can be like only uh, used in a trusted environment uh, and uh, just make sure that like uh, you're not like replicating that they are. You can have like a bunch of logic there. But yeah, that, that, that's a good question. And, and also with your system, how do you see the uh, impact of, let's say, um, people who are using scripts to run things off of off of your uh, off of your network? Uh, you used the example of Axie Infinity early on, and that's one example of people being paid to use a network. Uh, but on the other hand, the next generation of, uh, let's say, uh, blockchain games is, al is already showing signs of, of several projects where the game's actually just playing themselves. <laughs> it, and, and, the, and the humans don't do anything but watch. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, like uh, bots and stuff like that, you mean, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Th that's already happening, like, on Wall Street, right? Like, it's not a new thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it's natural, like, th that is happening in DeFi and, like, yeah, it's more like uh, market makers than uh, actually users. So, yes. But uh, yeah, like th that's the hard piece for us. Like we need to have like proper governance in place so that uh, it doesn't happen that you have like a bunch of like bots that are like building those profiles. So you might require some uh, decentralized identity or something like that. But yeah, we are very far from that right now. So uh, also, it's important to differentiate two things. Like one is like customer facing uh, apps and that's like uh, the Instagram uh, of the world. But then you have like computing and like things that are happening in the data center. For that, you're gonna get like 20X more efficient computing. I think that's enough like <laughs> to like convert like mo most of like the machine learning job, mm. uh, most of the rendering, maybe encoding. And you have networks that are very specialized at that and very good at that. But the issue that they have right now is that it's mostly retrieving data from the cloud and storing data on the cloud. And then like um, serving that through CDNs. So like they are still paying like most of the fees for retrieval and storage rather than like uh, the encoding itself. Thank you. There was one more question. Yeah, I think this is uh, a question for maybe both of you. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, all uh, I'm all pro of the open source, uh, but you know, uh, 76% of uh, the hacks 2021 was related to DeFi, which tells me that we have been unfortunately overrepresented in that space. So how can we ensure still security and trust uh, for the different entrepreneurs? Because it still tells me that we have a long way still to go because this is not a number to be uh, really proud of. Yeah. So I think this is like, uh, that, uh, I can see the pattern is that the moment we start connecting with payments, and you know the different projects start generating billions, then it becomes sort of uh, more interesting for the hackers to yeah. have a look on it. Yeah, I can take this since <laughs> I spent two years building monitoring for smart contracts. Uh, so yeah, like uh, 
first of all, like um, always in the beginning when you have like a new paradigm, of course you're gonna have bugs, like because like most of them have not been solved because they were just built. S especially when you have like a new programming language, especially with that, when that programming language was built <laughs> just because someone needed like a script to do things, like not even thinking that that would become like um, half a trillion <laughs> of the, uh, even more now, like because also you have like the value locked in the smart contracts. That's why it's happening in DeFi right now because like most of DeFi is just CVM based. On the other hand, like it's normal because like you, in a year you have like 15x value growth in a year. All the hackers of this world are gonna just do that. Like well, why would they do anything else? And it's so easy to extract the value because everything is open. So if they do it, like they just take the tokens and sell them somewhere else. And maybe the last piece of the transaction goes through like a mixer and uh, it magically like is clean. So you can even put it like right away uh, in DeFi, like <laughs> generate yields on that. You don't even need to move it uh, right away. So that, that's why it's happening right now. Whether it's gonna happen uh, in the web free world, probably, but in my opinion, less because first of all, you don't have that much value that is concentrated. Uh, secondly, because we are not building like new programming languages other than like the workflow, which is like not like uh, for everything, it's just to define like how there is gonna be computing on. Uh, but uh, are you gonna have like hacks? I mean like smart contracts are in a way are very similar to like centralized infrastructure because like if you hack like a contract that has like a lot of liquidity going through that contract, it's like hacking Facebook because you hack Facebook once and you have a lot of value that to extract. But like, what would you need to do like to hack like all the users that are storing something on IPFS? I don't know, like uh, it won't be that easy because like not all the nodes are gonna be storing all the data. For then like, uh, yeah, it's hard to imagine now, but yeah, I think it's gonna be much better than, than now for sure. Well, and, and I'll just take one other note on that, is you're talking about a very small piece of the ecosystem overall. You take Bitcoin, never been hacked, right? Find me a technology company that's never been hacked in the Web2 world. Doesn't exist, right? Not one that's been around for a decade, right? So think about that. And so give these early projects new languages, massive value increase, inexperienced teams, blah, blah, blah. Like there's lots of reasons, don't love it at all, but the projects that survive have done so with a security that's been unrivaled in the traditional company and technology space. And so that's, that's what I look to and that these DeFi new languages are sort of noise right now. And I'm actually, we're actually lucky it's happening because you get all this crap out of the way and you are, you're, you, you, you be, you're careful about investing in those things right now. And so that's actually fine, but the mature ones are safer than anything else. I mean, yeah. it always seems to be that we need to be cursed by something. Initially, yeah. that was JavaScript. Yeah. Like, <laughs> now we have solidity, and yeah. I think uh, it's unfortunate. But like, yeah. probably that's like also how things work in general. Like, initially, also as a startup, you're trying to just have a product that is barely working. Yeah. So those uh, like products have like much more chances of succeeding because actually some people can start using them, and if the need is big enough, they get to traction. Uh, when they have traction, like they are gonna solve the technical issues. The same happened with Ethereum. Like it was the first ones to have smart contracts. You could do anything else. You did not have any other language. For enough time, that was the case. And like most of the people first built smart contracts on that. Then small opportunities arise to actually build tooling for that. And then it's done. It's the same what happened like in cloud providers. Like, <laughs> like if you build like a new smart contract uh, language, then you need to build all the tooling and you need to like attract enough people that are gonna be writing that, enough people that are gonna be like interested in business, uh, in building businesses that are building tools that are not possible in the beginning because you have like a hundred developers. Why would you create like a business that is building something for a hundred developers? So yeah, 
like that first mover advantage is so strong that we unfortunately are gonna probably stick with the solidity for a while. One more question, yeah? Thank you so much again, Vuk, uh, Tom. Let's give a round of applause. Okay, um, I hope uh, you're all still energized to continue networking. We still have drinks and there will be sauna. So yeah, enjoy your evening. <laughs> Thank you so much.